grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for asking me to do this. Uh, Devin and I go back a long way. We're members, uh, we're members of the same parish. And uh, this has been a favorite church of mine. You didn't even know it, did you? It's been a favorite church of mine for years. When I was a child, uh, my father uh, had Volvos, and Steve White uh, Volvo was the only Volvo dealer in the area. And so we would, on some occasions, drive uh, to Hickory to have uh, Dad's car serviced. We always passed this church, and my father would always remark, now that is a church. Look at that little church standing like a star over the valley. You've always been a star in my heart. And I thank you for calling a beloved brother in the faith, and I thank you for your faithfulness over these decades. Thomas Kremner, probably the greatest liturgist in the English language, and his one of his most famous works is the English burial rite for the dead. Unfortunately, he didn't write it. It comes from a hymn of Martin Luther. But Cramner's service has become the funeral service. It's beautiful, and it has an unflinching seriousness. It's got an intensity, but it's coupled with a joyful and confident hope. Never does Jesus appear more glorious and filled with love and power than when believers gather at the graveside establishing and creating goodness in life's worst moment. But as I say, that rite itself was borrowed from uh, Media Vita in Morta Sumus, a great uh, 8th century Gregorian chant that Luther set to a hymn that is in, on page 775 of the LSB. Many no longer know this great hymn. I'm sorry to say that modern Americans don't sing almost to the same level they don't think. <laughs> and so this hymn has fallen into neglect, but it is one of the most powerful statements of the faith in all of Christendom. It begins the third verse, mitten in der Hölle Angst unsere Sund und Streben, talking about the terrors of life. So that verse begins with the terrors of life, and it ends, Lass uns nicht anfahren, wann das Rücken Glaubens trust, Kyrie eleison. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away, is still creation. Nowhere is God more powerful, beautiful, and sublime than he is at death. The topic of the sermon this morning is the priesthood. Leviticus 10 and its counterpart, Exodus 29, is the history of the establishment of Israel's priesthood. It's interesting reading. I doubt that anyone suspects how bloody and gory the sacrificial process really was. Buckets of blood splashed on the altar. Josephus tells us that the altar of sacrifice outside the tent of meeting and then later the temple had drains the size of downspouts to carry all the blood away. Priests in spotless white robes and bright slashes danced before the congregation with bloody chunks of meat. Bloody shoulders of bulls and rams were raised, waved, nupa is the Hebrew, raised and shaken before the entire assembly. So why was the early faith so bloody? The 
because sin is a bloody thing. In the Old Testament, the innocent blood of Abel still weeps for judgment. And all of this sacrificial blood carried to the downspouts is but a drop in the ocean of the suffering of nature and humanity. Think of all of the wars of human history. 800,000 Lutherans died in the 30-year war raged against them by the Catholic princes. That's about the same number of Americans who died in the Civil War. Six million Jews died at the hands of Germany, the most Christian country in Europe. Think of COVID, cancer, and all of the diseases that immolate and destroy our bodies. Think of the millions of demons that inhabit the heads of our countrymen. No matter how much blood, without the cross, the sacrifice is just not enough. But the sheer spectacle of this gore is good news. God throws his people's sin in their face. God shows his people the depth of their sin measured in the blood that it has cost. And in the impossibility of it all, he announces his forgiveness. So Leviticus, though bloody, is the first liturgical worship book. As such, it is law and gospel. No true worship can exclude either. The priest is the loci of that impossible dilemma that humanity faces. God established the priesthood so that people could be certain their sins were forgiven. And this is the reason for all of the blood and the regulations of Leviticus. The only possibility for friendship with God and each other. And in the same strong manner, in the Leviticus passage, we see God provide for the livelihood of Aaron and those who would follow him in the priesthood. That is given to the priest. The wave offering was a portion of the sacrifice presented to God, then released by God for the use of the priests who made the sacrifice. The meat fed the families of the priests. It was God's provision for those who sacrificed themselves to sacrifice to him. And from those very chunks of meat that were nupa raised, lifted to heaven, God foreshadows and promises an even more lavish and impossible lifting. John 3, 13 to 16, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Only by looking to what is impossible can we get a glimpse of God. Those waved chunks of meat cry like Abel's blood for the cross to be lifted up. And upon that cross is gathered finally Abel's innocent blood, the entire bloodiness of human history, and the cries even of nature for relief. The flood of the curse and nothingness like the abyss of chaos crash upon him who hangs there as all of the might of nihilism and evil is gathered for its last stand, and, and the blood of Leviticus, as the temple veil is ripped asunder, becomes the blood of God's pure lamb. The curse, the blood, becomes salvation. And from the Son of Man high and lifted up flows the saving blood infinitely more copious than all of the blood of all of the sacrifices of all of the pain and the sickness and the death that humans ever go through. This time is a blessing and not a curse. It washes you through the church and into heaven and there you see yourself in the saving blood. Revelation 7, 13 to 14. Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? 
And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. But what does all this have to do with the installation of Pastor Devon to be your pastor at Augustana, you ask? This is an installation, not the first Sunday of Lent. Well, my dear Christian friends, you need a pastor because life is still a bloody thing. Sin still grows deep into the very stump of our arteries. God provided Aaron to his people because of bloody evil. Only in the spectacle of the gore of the law can the forgiveness of sins become concrete, absolute, and the world's sweetest thing. But the gift of a Lutheran pastor is even more of a wonder. That gift comes by way of Philippi that we read in the gospel today and upon a confession that seems no great stuff by worldly standards. It occurs at Philippi, the city par excellence dedicated to the world. And there, Simon is given a name change indicating a new shift, a new action of and from God. He has a calling, a kaleo, a true calling, not just a name change, of course, which he gets, kephos, which means stone, another Hebraism of Aramaic origin, and Gentiles were often called stones. Peter's not yet a stone. Oh, how we know that. But that's still his God-given calling. Devon also has a kaleo. He is now your pastor. That is his new self. That is the God-given call. Like Peter and the rest of us, he will have his good times and his questionable times. All of us call pastors or like Peter. We have a sacred call, but we're not very good at it. So it keeps on calling. My father had a dear friend who was an old mountain pastor. And he met him one day at the post office and asked him, Pastor Vance, how did your revival go over at Hanging Dog? Yes, there is a Hanging Dog, North Carolina. It's over near Murphy. Pastor Vance said, the people are nice. I said, that place is between the forest and the wilderness. He said, I tell you, if God called me to hang a dog, he'd have to call me every morning, because sure as evening I'd be gone. You have a calling, Devin. And these people have called you. And that is one of God's miracles when that works together. Unlike our Roman Catholic brothers, we possess nothing innate placed within us by the hand of the bishop. Yet when we do what we are charged to do under God's word, the very power of God walks abroad. In a few moments, Devon is going to be installed. He will go on a wilderness journey. He will walk in front of you between the chancel, the pulpit, and the altar. That is his calling. The very sources of the lavish outpouring of God's gifts. He will promise to do his best to fulfill the role of God's sacred priest ordained in the ancient shadows of the faith. He will promise to do his utmost for you. But like Aaron, St. Peter, and all the brothers that came after him, Devon will not be perfect. Even though our beloved church, the Lutheran Church, Missouri, ascended like so many others, unlike so many others today, it does expect him to try. But keep in mind, dear Christian friends, that it is a horrific, gory, but most honorable thing that you've called him to do. And my dear brothers and sisters, when he fails, and he will because he's but human, it will be the, his failure and not the mysteries of the faith. 
they will be as pure and as efficacious as ever. And when you fail him and each other, and you will because you are but human, look more deeply into those mysteries, that pulpit, altar, and baptism, and you will see not human failure, but the light of eternity. Now God has granted you the most lavish of gifts straight out of his mysteries. God has given you a Lutheran pastor. So that as he lifts Jesus' ripped and bloody body, you may look to Jesus and be absolutely certain that your sins are forgiven. That is what Devon has to do with Aaron in the midst of death. A Lutheran pastor brings life. Praise God.